fall apart because of broken relationships. Bosses and their staff go through stress because of broken relationships. And you have this chair filled, please. And people who plan to get married many times don't make it to the altar because of broken relationships. And then there are those who do get married and they end up in divorce and that is trauma, broken relationships. Then there are those who are planning to marry again after divorce, relationship problems, what a struggle. Then there are those who are married and they seem to be doing well. They're the ones I'm especially concerned about because they don't tell the truth most of the time. They parade a good face. They pretend and all the while they are going through silent hell. I would rather be single and frustrated than married and frustrated. Matter of fact, I am convinced that the loneliest people in the world are not unmarried people. The loneliest people in the world are married people who are trapped in a marriage that's not working. At least if you're lonely and you're not married, can I fill these seats please sir? At least if you're lonely and not married, you could at least go be friends with somebody and go out with somebody have some ice cream. But when you're married and it ain't working, you can't go and have ice cream with nobody. It's, it's hell on earth. As a matter of fact, it's more important for you to not be married than to be married and wish you weren't. So I'm very happy that we are going through this series. I put up on the screen, my wife and I, our picture doesn't come out too good there, but we, we are really good looking people, I promise you. We've been married for 25 years, and this is our renewal of vows photograph. And we, we've been enjoying 25 years of wonderful marriage. Uh, I just celebrated this afternoon with so many wonderful friends, my wife's 50th birthday. Don't tell I told you that. Both of us are 50 years old. That means we have spent half of our lives with one another already. And it has been so much fun being married. But I know that it could have been hell. The secret to successful marriage is not love. Don't marry a person because you think you love them or they say they love you. Wrong reason. Love does not make marriage successful. Now your grandmother and your grandfather stayed together, but it wasn't because of love. It was because of the culture at that time that we call respectful dependency. She depended on him for her livelihood because 50 years ago, women were not working outside the home. And so it was very, very understandable for a woman to remain with a man no matter how he treated her. And some of you got stories that you can tell me about your grandmother putting up with so much and never leaving. Not because she didn't want to leave, believe me, but because of the socio-economic cultural environment, it was to her benefit to stay in spite of. He also depended on her because he was not ready to bring up the children by himself. And he was not going to clean up no house. 
So he depended on her, she depended on him, and therefore the unity was based on mutual respect and dependency, not love. However, that has changed now, hasn't it? Because now women are out working the same hours you're working, which means when they come home tired, you're tired, and they're tired now. And so your grandfather used to meet the food on the table, but things change now. Ain't no food on the table, not unless you get Kentucky on the way back home. Having a warm bath run for you and your newspaper on the chair with your bedroom slippers waiting at the, at the lazy boy chair. Them days are over. It's a different world. And what's even more challenging is the relationship is no longer dependent on dependency. Because he could leave you now and put the kids up for adoption. Or he could keep them and let a day care center bring them up. She could leave now and still keep her standard of living because she's probably making more money than you anyhow. Matter of fact, when you met her, she had a car already and perhaps a house and some real estate. See, things have changed. So don't get this idea that relationships work because of love. Now, love is important, and you've got all kinds of definitions of love. We're going to deal with that later on in about two weeks. But, but this is important to understand that, that love does not make a successful relationship, especially when you talk about marriage. And so I want to clarify some things. Uh, I want to begin tonight with a scripture that I call it the pivot of Jesus' discussion on singleness, marriage, and divorce. In one chapter, he dealt with all three of them. He dealt with singleness, he dealt with marriage, and he dealt with divorce in one chapter. Turn your Bibles, if you have them, to the book of Matthew, chapter 19. Matthew, chapter 19. I keep referring back to this because I believe it is the New Testament's charter on relationships. This passage is loaded with Jesus' secret wisdom on male-female relationships. Women get along fine with women, and men get along fine with men. But when a woman and a man get together, the potential for conflict goes up by 98%. Because nothing is as complicated as a male and a female. Now it seems like the female is a little bit more complicated than the male. I used to think so. I did my research and read a lot of books, studied a lot of journals, went to a lot of seminars, and I've come to the conclusion that that is not true. They are both equally complicated. They are very different, but they are complicated. God made them that way. But complication is an opinion. Because complication gets its definition from ignorance. Say la. Something is only, only complicated if you are ignorant about it. Am I right? If you know how to cook grits, it ain't complicated. If you know how to make baked macaroni with cheese, it's not complicated. It's easy for you. But for someone who doesn't know how to do it, it's complicated. So a male is really not complicated. And a female is not complicated. The problem is you are ignorant. Wherever there is ignorance, there is experimentation. 
So when we don't know something, we experiment with it. That means we keep taking these different tests. We keep testing it to see what works or what doesn't work, what might work, what might not work. That's called an experiment. Because we don't know how and what the results are. Here we find Jesus being approached by some very educated religious leaders in Matthew 19. And these are actually professors of the law, referring to the law of Moses, which governed the lives of the people at the time. And it also governed their social relationships. Uh, Moses laid down the law. It was not a religious law that Moses created. This is important. It was a law for national development. So the laws that Moses laid down were for a nation, not for a religion. God gave Moses tremendous wisdom from above as to how people are to live together within the context of a social development, a society. How they are to live and then marry and then remain married. God gave Moses all of these wonderful principles. And here we find in this chapter 19 of Matthew, those who claim to have been experts in that law asking a question to the one who wrote the law. Let's read what they say. Verse 3. Some of the Pharisees, that's the law, lawyers, came to him to test him. And they asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? They addressed him with a problem of divorce. To understand the context of this verse, you have to learn a little bit of hermeneutics. You must go back and study the history and the environment and the culture. Uh, this event is taking place 400 years after Malachi dies. Malachi is the last book in the Old Testament. Malachi was the last prophet that God spoke to regarding the coming of the Messiah. And Malachi also introduces John the Baptist in his last chapter. In Malachi, that considers now 400 years before this event here in Matthew, Malachi was alive. In the time of Malachi, the number one epidemic in society was divorce. As a matter of fact, some of you are looking at me funny, so let's just take a look at this. I sometimes I say, say things I forget that, you know, you might not know what I know. Turn to Malachi. Go back to the last book in the Old Testament. Very interesting. Chapter 2 of Malachi. I want to show you how horrible it was. As a matter of fact, during the time of Malachi... A man could divorce his wife for some of the most silliest reasons you could dream of. For example, if a man married a woman and she burned the food while cooking, he would divorce her. It was that bad. If a woman went to bed with her husband and he approached her for intercourse, and she did not advise him that she was in a menstruation period. He divorced her. It was dumb. It was so bad. A woman could get a divorce during the time of Malachi if a man was having a meal with his friends, men friends, and she came in and stayed too long in the room. It was silly. But it was real. So we find God prophesying through Malachi against this attitude of this destruction of marriages. I won't read the whole thing, but I want you to just get the spirit of it. Look at verse 13. God is prophesying through Malachi. He says, another thing you do, you flood the Lord's altar with tears, you weep and you wail because 
he no longer pays attention to your offerings or accepts them with pleasure from your hands? You ask, why? Doesn't the Lord hear my prayer or receive my offerings? You know, you're complaining, why don't God answer my prayers? Why am I not getting any more miracles from God or whatever? He says, you ask, why? And he answers, it is because the Lord is acting as the witness between you and the wife of your youth. Underline that. In other words, God was at your wedding. You thought it was only the bridesmaid and the groomsmen that was witnesses. He says, but I was there. And I witnessed you telling this woman, you will love her and her only until you die. And I heard you tell this man, you will submit to him and be a wife to him until you die. He says, I was present and I was taking notes. Read the next statement. But you have broken faith with her. Your prayer depends on your vows. Ah. Before you get married, remember now, you are not married now, think. Your prayers are getting answered easier. When you get married, the person you married could mess up your prayer life. The Bible says, if a husband and a wife are together, First Peter says this, he says, if you are angry with your spouse, God will not hear your prayer. So you ain't married now, your prayers could be answered easily. Remember when you are marrying someone, you are marrying a potential prayer hinderer. <laughs> Serious business. Because if you are mad with your wife, you cannot go in the next room and pray. Impossible. Because the scripture says, when you come before God to offer your prayers, and you know that someone has ought against you. It says, don't even offer your prayer. Go back in the next room. Make it right with them first. See? Now right now, you ain't married, so you don't want to go in the next room too to make it right first. All the married people smiling at me. They ain't saying if they're smiling. They know what I'm talking about. This is heavy stuff here. He said, that's why I don't listen to your prayer. Watch this. He says, even though she is your partner, underline that, she ain't your domestic servant. I am reading Old Testament here. He says, your wife is your partner, not your slave to wash dishes and iron shirts and cook food. She is your partner. Partner means equal in status. Equal in contribution, equal in value, equal in worth, equal in substance. Amen. She's your partner. She ain't your old lady. She's your partner. Look at the last part. And she is the wife of your what? Marriage covenant. He says, you break faith with that. Verse 15, he tells us why he married you. Now this is important here. Because when we read uh, Matthew again, you're going to see he connects us to this statement. He says, has not the Lord made them one? Who made them one? See, God was at your wedding, or if you get married, remember, you don't need to send an invitation to God. He shows up. If you claim he is your Lord, then he has a right to show up at the wedding. And he said, he is the Lord, and he made you one, in flesh that's important uh, Genesis chapter 
chapter 1 and chapter 2 talks about male and female and in chapter 2 it says for this cause should a man leave his what mother and father and cleave unto his wife and the two shall become what one flesh now in Malachi he's repeating it he says I made you two in flesh very important and spirit keep reading because you are mine says the Lord let me tell you something marriage is not about you I want you to think about this if you if you are married God don't consider you married for you you are married for him God will give you a wife because of something he wants from you can I prove it let's read it he says I made you one in flesh and spirit you are mine and why he asked God say now let me he said you want to know why he answers it he says because I was seeking godly seed you know why people get divorced because they got married If God married you, you cannot get a divorce. Why? It's not about you or how you feel. Matter of fact, God really ain't interested in you in marriage. What's he interested in? Read it. Righteous seed. Righteous seed. The reason why God created marriage is to guarantee his future. Your children are more important to God than your feelings toward your husband. You know, I used to read the scripture in First Corinthians, it makes me angry, uh, chapter 7. Uh, it says, if you live with an ungodly person, Stay with them. <laughs> he said, no matter how they behave, stay with them. And it tells you why. It says, so that the children might be sanctified. You see, it's not about you. What we've done is we've made marriage about us. Whether am I happy? Am I satisfied? Am I comfortable? Do I still love him? Do I still love her? Do I still want to put up with this person? Do I like their personality? Do they? Do I like what I found out? I, I, I. It ain't about you. You know why God loved Abraham? I figured it out years ago. I was about 18 years old when I figured out a revelation about Abraham. God says, Abraham, this is found in uh, Genesis chapter 18. He said, let me tell you something. He said, the reason why I love you and I will tell you secrets is because you will teach your children and your servants the commandments of the Lord. In other words, you are going to make your offspring righteous. I'm going to be your God. Uh, this is a little secret, but I don't, don't get nervous about this, okay? But let me tell you something. The more righteous you are, if you're not careful, you'll have plenty of children. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Now, the reason is because God wants righteous seed. So when you become a more righteous man, a more righteous woman, God begins to find a womb that guarantees the potential of righteous seed.
Read the next part. It gets worse. He says, So God yourself, in your spirit and do not break faith with the wife of your youth do not divorce her why it's not about you if you want to have children as a married couple and you have a little child challenges you know what to do use this verse and go back and pray Put it on God. All right, God, I am now ready to produce righteous children. I am available. You will conceive. Because this gives you a kingdom promise. Now verse 16, read out loud, please. I hate divorce says the Lord. There's that verse. You always wanted to find it. There it is. Do you see why God hates divorce? Because you are meddling with his program for the future. God's future is in children. And when you disrupt the functioning of those children's incubation within marriage, you are meddling with the success of his program for the future. That's why you must stay married. This time, it has to work. It ain't about you. God said, don't even, don't even mention the word divorce to me. You know, God is love. But boy, when love tells you it hates something, gosh, that must be terrible to that love. There's a deep reason why he hates it. And now you know why. Because the only hope God has for the future of the world is planting the seeds in the children. And when you disrupt that, you are interfering with his will and his purpose in the earth. That's why God really calls a homosexuality an abomination. Because it disrupts the program. So don't get involved in all the other discussions about it. It's this disruption. He hates that also because it disrupts the program. There's no way that God ever planned for two men to bring up a child. It, 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 it cannot work. The child will come out imbalanced and temporarily insane and perhaps permanently damaged psychologically. Because God's program is for the unique, inherent, female idiosyncrasies to contribute to the development of a child and for the strange uniqueness of a male to contribute to the development of that child so that child comes out balanced. Can't happen with two women. I hate divorce, says the Lord, the God of Israel. Verse 16, read it. And I hate a man's covering himself with violence as well as with his garments, says the Lord Almighty. I hate divorce and I hate a man trying to cover up the reason why he should do it you know we always got this way well you know uh, I don't love her anymore God what are you talking about covenants have no feeling When you sign a contract, there is no feeling in that paper. I don't love him anymore. God says, so what? You're trying to cover up your selfish desire 
to be free again by this vain leap explanation. He says, go back and consider why I married you in the first place. Children's sake. Now, I'm talking to a room that has divorced people in it, remarried people in it, and some of you can't wait to get there. Whatever state you are in, as of this minute, you know better. Is that clear? Okay. God forgives your past, but he don't forgive your future. You create that. So, walk in the light that you have, the scripture says. Once you get light, he expects you to live according to what you learn. You shouldn't have come to this seminar tonight. In the name of Jesus. Clap right there. Good place to clap. Praise God. You should have stayed home. But I'm glad you came anyhow. Amen. Amen. I say amen. Amen. Matthew 19, let's go back in. Now, Christ is dealing with this issue. Now, I wanted you to see what was happening in Malachi. Guess what? That's 400 years before Jesus came. So by the time he came, <laughs> it was so much worse that the religious leaders who were in charge of the law gave up. So they said, should a man divorce a woman for any and every reason? By the time Jesus came, I read an article some time ago in my university study. It says, a woman would be divorced from her husband for sneezing at the meal. Now that's bad. <laughs> that means when you want to sneeze, I don't know what you do as a woman. You got to run from the table or something? I mean, nature. It's crazy. That's how bad it was. Jesus answered, haven't you read that at the beginning of creation, the Creator made them male and what? Female. He ignored the question and went back to the male and female issue. He went back where? To the beginning. And that's important. They were dealing with a symptom, as far as he was concerned. He was addressing the problem. He said, the problem is not divorce. See, divorce is a symptom of something else that's wrong. Now he's the manufacturer, so he knows the whole product. He says, look, I never created divorce. It's not God's product. God knows anything about it. Moses invented divorce. He said, but in my manufacturer's manual, uh, it, God, the creator, he began with male and female. He, created, he, created, he, he began with, with one male and one female and they were both unmarried and that's what you begin with you begin with a male and you begin with a female you know when I wrote the books on male and female you know they became best-selling books thank God people are reading them and I'm happy to hear that you know all over the bookstores I've been people got it in the bookstores and I'm happy to see that but the reason why I focus on them separately is because you see the average male don't know this to be a male and then the average woman don't know what a male is supposed to be and then vice versa. A female don't know what a female is supposed to be. So she picks up for what her mama taught her and her mama didn't know. So we keep generationally passing on ignorance. So we keep getting the same results in every generation. And then a male doesn't know what a female is supposed to be. And so he got his own cousin from his mama. He got trouble now. Jesus says, look, you began with the wrong male and the wrong female. And you're trying to get God's results, which is a good marriage. Now, marriage is God's product, not divorce. And so he says, look, <laughs> you are trying to get success with another man's product without following his ingredient specifications. He began first with a male and a female. He focused on male and female first. He didn't focus on marriage. Let me make an announcement here. And this shocked me when I figured it out. I was 16 years old when I figured this out. 16 years old, very young. I discovered that God did not begin the human race with a couple. 
Go back and read your Bible. We've been taught that the human family is built on marriage. That is not true. That's why Christ says, look, from the beginning, He didn't say God married them. It says male. Then female. Then whom God joins. See, it's a process. You focus on the unmarried state first. Let me tell you something. We keep thinking that when we marry someone, they will improve. Big mistake. <laughs> you get what you married. If she is lazy before the altar, there's a lazy woman in a white dress walking down the aisle towards you, brother. Nothing happens in the church. No change, nothing. If he is mean, stingy, like to keep his money tight, selfish, you got a tuxedo with selfishness on the inside. And you're going to sleep with selfishness and stinginess that night. <laughs> Nothing happens at the altar. So what you got to do is sort out all that before you decide to go to the altar. Right. Now tell me plain, are you stingy? Let me know now. Right. So I can prepare myself. I don't want no surprises in the middle of this thing, you know. And that's why you should not rush into marriage. The Bible says be sober with marriage. And the word sober doesn't mean you were drinking. The word sober means objectively thinking. That means you analyze, uh, uh, calculate, you, you systematize, scrutinize, you, you, you dissect. Then you reset, dissect, 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 dissect. And when you are satisfied that you know the sinews and the ligaments of this person's personality and, and how they act under pressure, that's sober. You see, when two people are in love, they never tell the truth. Mm. Why? It is not in your best interest to tell the truth if you are in love with somebody. <laughs> Check them under pressure. You ain't married, right? So you say, I can pick you up at 5 o'clock from work. You ain't married, you know. And guess what? Something happens and you come late, 5.30. Matter of fact, you should try this. <laughs> oh, this is mischievous, but I'm going to say it anyhow. This is mischievous. Come late intentionally and then start taking notes. See how they act under disappointment. Why? That's what you're going to live with for the rest of your life. Where you been? I've been standing in the corner, all this, this carbon dioxide. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa, I didn't know you was like this, see? It's a little test. It's a little test. Pressure. Pressure. Go to a restaurant and pretend you forgot your money. <laughs> uh, oh my goodness, you have any change? <laughs> and just watch. <laughs> male and female. He said, go back and check the male and female first. The lowest denominator of human relationship in social development is not marriage. It's singleness. It's better for you to study a person while they're unmarried and single and decide before that whether you can live together. Because after marriage, it's too late. Too much trauma. Undrama. 
Sometimes you got to decide, you know, I don't know if this is going to work. And be honest. Because marriage is not a joke. We've made it very light. It's not. That's why we got so many hurting people in our society. I mean, they mad at everybody, including God. Because their relationship didn't work out. And they can't blame God. They didn't follow his recipe. Oh, by the way, uh, when Christ finished this seminar, the seminar was so heavy. Uh, I won't go through it, but let's read what the disciples said at the end of the seminar. Because he talked about, you know, uh, single, male and female. And for this reason should a man leave his mother and father and cleave unto his wife. Verse 5, the two shall become what? One flesh. There's that term again. So they are no longer two, but one. They are no longer two, but what? One. That includes salaries. See, you can't handle one. Okay, before you get married, you got fifty thousand dollars in the bank, and she got two hundred in the bank. Two hundred dollars. You got fifty thousand. See, and the problem? No, let's reverse it. She got fifty thousand. You got two hundred. See, I'm not even getting married. What you going to decide here? problems right away I saved up all of my money as a single woman and that's my account and I labored and I stored up and I disciplined myself yeah, 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 yeah. and you only got 200 and that's all you bring in but let me tell you something <laughs> see and that ain't one you're making a deal let's make a deal <laughs> I keep my 50 you keep your 200 We'll sleep together, have fun, but don't fool with my 50. See, that, 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 that ain't marriage. That's an arrangement. And you thought you were ready for marriage. And you see, and some of y'all ain't got nothing. Like broke. <laughs> I had a young couple come to me a couple of years ago, talking about they won't get married. The parents called me. You know, they won't get married. I said, now listen to them. I asked them five questions. I said, what you all talking about? Go back to school. <laughs> they got nothing. Nothing plus nothing leaves nothing. <laughs> so you got to have something if you want to be with me. <laughs> <laughs> Two shall become one. That means to marry someone, you got to be willing to take your 50000 and submit it, not to the person, but to the institution of marriage. It becomes property of the institution. What a sacrifice. Some folks ain't ready for that. Verse 7. No, verse 6. So they are no longer two but one. Therefore, what God joined together, let no man put what? Asunder. That means lawyer. Don't let no lawyer put asunder. If God joined you together, and he's referring to what? The male and female in the beginning. So you've got to go back and make yourself a beginning male. And go back and make yourself a beginning female. Study Eve and study Adam before the fall. And try and get back into that state. And you can. That's why my books are so intense on this. Because if you don't get the male and female back to the beginning, you cannot expect the results the manufacturer promised. I told you all in the last session that we, we have relations like, like we have cookbooks, you know, we like cookbooks. We like buy cookbooks. On one picture, the page, I like the pictures in the cookbook, they're pretty, ooh, ah. The most beautiful pictures in the world are cookbook pictures. Come on, talk to me. Lord of mercy, everything finished and nice, baked, everything baked. On the other page, there's a whole lot of writing. Not edible at all. And most of us want the picture without the recipe. The question was, here's the question. They were looking at the picture and they said, 
Why did the cake fall? Why is this bread dumb, hard? Why did this cake collapse? And Jesus says, well, ain't no mystery. Let's go back to the recipe page. No, 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 no. We just want to, no, no. He said, go back to the beginning. Find out what you baked this with. Yes, sir. Yes. Yes, sir. Don't blame the cake. Nothing wrong with this cake. So you got to study the yeast, the egg you're using. Because you see, I figured out a long time ago, eggs are more important than omelets. Am I right? Marriage is an omelet. It is only as good as the eggs. No matter how much of a wonderful marriage you want. You dreaming about it? And no one dreams of a more perfect marriage than a single woman. I tell you, I tell you women. Oh, Jesus. A single woman got a fairy tale mind. Perfect man. Perfect house. Perfect children. Perfect knockoff time. Perfect walk in the park together every evening. Perfect prayer time in the morning on time. Perfect praying for the meal with the children around the table. Perfect family altar every day. Perfect lie. But she has it in her mind. But she don't study the eggs. I told you all I did an experiment years ago. I did it. I did this. I never forget the experiment. I, I put a hole in one of the eggs and I left it outside the refrigerator for five days. It was stink. It stunk. Then I took a fresh egg out of the refrigerator and I made an omelet out of the two eggs and I fried it. My mom almost killed me. It stunk the whole house. And the omelet was so stink. Obviously, you know, I couldn't eat it. But it was my experiment. My experiment proved one thing. Actually, two things. One, no matter how good the good egg is. Bad egg will always win. Well, I know he don't go to church. I know he don't read his Bible. I know he ain't a Christian. I know he don't study the Word. I know, but he's a nice guy. He nicer than some of the Christians I know. Well, I know she don't go to any church, you know, but she cool. She fine, man. She good looking. Ooh, she cute. 36, 25, 37. Mm. Got a PhD and nothing. Sharp lady. Cute. Okay. Don't worry, Pastor. After we get married, I'm going to get her to come to church. Well, <laughs> well you want to see how sweet your egg is now. <laughs> oh, Pastor Miles, I know he can come to church after we get married. He doesn't tell me he's coming. I'll never forget what I heard some years ago, and that is this. If he didn't change to get you, he won't change to keep you. Case clothes. Bad egg, bad omelet. Simple. The second thing I learned from this one is, is that once you make an omelet, you can never get eggs again. So what you got to do is seriously think about who you should crack with before you yoke up. <laughs> Study the yoke.
before you crack. <laughs> in other words, if they got a crack in their character, you can have yourself a stinking omelet. Work on them. And by the way, I discovered something, you know. Uh, you got to study people's background. We, we, we don't do this, you know, but you got to do that. Yep. Study the stock they came from. Now, and that, that, that might sound a little bit objective, but it is. It should be. Now, it doesn't mean you can't marry the person. Because, see, based on their background, will determine how much work you got to do and how much you got to put up with. I'm saying something deep here. You, please get this tape. This is important. Study where they're coming from. Are they coming from a family where there's a lot of hell, harassment, violence, brokenness, loud, boisterous hatred, history of wife abuse and alcohol? Think about the history. It doesn't mean you can't marry them, but you've got to understand that you've got more work to do if you marry that person. If they grew up without a, a functioning family, you got work to do. See, if you married a guy who had no father, you realize you got to be his mother? Because he had become so close to his mother, he ain't looking for no wife. You think he does. He wants another mother. And you don't want to be no mother. You want to be wife. Fight start already. But my mother always, see, tell you, my mother, see, and he doesn't, and that gets you right where it hurts, right? You go, now, listen to me. Don't you compare. See, and then trouble. I want you to understand that he's coming out of a culture. So you got to understand, okay, if that's true, then you got to agree, okay, I'll live with that. And then I'm going to work on it. So I got to maybe try to get it. You know, a couple of men friends to be his friends so they can help to daddy him. You know, deal with that issue. Because he never had that image of a father. And you can't be it as a wife. And so you got stress in the relationship. You didn't study where the egg came from. Very serious. I remember uh, Abraham... He's a smart fella. Abraham's son grew up. Abraham's okay, time for my son to have a wife. Now he lived in a village, right? All these girls around. He told the servant, look, there's another village down the street. Watch him now. Why? He choosing stock. Some of y'all don't choose stock. <laughs> he said, there's a village down the street where my kinsmen are. People who are like me, think like me got the same standard of mentality like me. He said, go to that area there. He says, and find a woman for my son. If she comes out of that stock, she come already with some stuff. Amen. My son ain't got too much work. Some of you thought you married someone. You didn't marry them. You married their mother. You married their father. And instead of spending time enjoying each other, you're spending time babying the person. Frustrating. Check the egg before you crack. Don't make omelet before you are satisfied that you're willing to live with the yolk. There ain't no perfect people in the world, but at least get as close as possible before you crack. Minimize the work. Because you're growing too old to be preoccupied trying to bring somebody up. Right. They're supposed to be up already. Yes. You're all quiet, man. What happened? <laughs> See, you, you don't want to bring nobody up. You, man, you, you're an adult now. You want to live in an adult, not a child. Some folks ain't there. They're 50 years old and still growing up. And then they marry you. Or you marry them. And then you wonder, why is this so difficult? It ain't difficult. You just didn't check the stock. Your marriage 
is only as good as your singleness. That's what Jesus was saying. He said, look, divorce is only possible when the combination you use was defective. My suggestion to you as an individual, whether you are married or not, is to spend the next six months improving yourself. Buy good books. Buy all of mine and read them for the first time. Go to seminars to improve yourself. Go to the bookstore and buy quality books to help you develop your personality and your communication skills and your ability to deal with human nature and behavioral science. In other words, develop yourself. I tell you, when you improve yourself automatically, all your relationships will improve. You'll be amazed. Work on your egg. Write this down, please. Until you are single, you are not ready for marriage. It's supposed to be four. Listen to me. It's very important, you know. Jesus was addressed with the issue of divorce. He ignored it. He said, no, this ain't a matter of divorce. He said, the problem is the male and female. Focus on the individuals first. So it's more important for you to become totally single than for you to be married. Please read my book on singleness and marriage. We got a new edition out. Please study it again, read it again. Don't assume you remember anything in it. Whether you are married or not married, that book is for you. We got a whole series of tapes on it. Develop your singleness. You see, and single, the word single is an interesting word. The word single means to be separate, unique, and whole. Write it down. It doesn't mean to be alone. God said it's not good for man to be alone. He never says single. Because single and alone are different. Alone is a word in the Hebrew which means exclusive. It means to be one of your kind. He said it's not good for man to be the only one of his kind. And that was true. Because there was no one to relate to. God, Adam, Adam couldn't relate to animals and birds and fish. He named them, but he couldn't relate to them. So God's not good for man to be exclusive or the one of his own kind. I will make him another just like him. So God made him another man, but he made it a female, a womb man, a man with the womb. Same. So when Adam saw her, Adam's response is correct. Adam says, wow, this is bone just like my bone structure and flesh just like my flesh. There was no hairy stuff, no scales, no feathers. That's the first time he ever saw an animal without scales, feathers, and hair. He said, wow, this is just like me. He said, for this reason should a man leave his mother and father, he had none, and cleave unto his wife who looked like this, and the two shall become one flesh. He found one just like himself. However, Adam was already single. What is single? He was separate. He was unique. Oh, the question is, are you those three things? To be separate means that you don't need nobody to be somebody. Uh-oh. Let me prove it. Adam didn't even know he needed anybody. Read the Bible. Ma Genesis chapter 3, chapter 2, verse 18 and 15. In, ch in, in chapter 15, God took the man, put him in the garden, blessed him with work and all that stuff. In verse 18, God says, it is not good. God said, it is God said. It is not good. Not Adam. Adam didn't even care. He never asked God, hey, what about me? No. He was completely preoccupied with his purpose, naming them animals, you know, dominating that garden. And, and that's what qualifies you to get married, is when you don't need to be. See, if all you could dream about is marriage, <laughs> you got to check yourself, man. You just walk around all day. I want to be married. I want to be married. I want to be married. Hey, you, come here. Come here. I want to be married. Oh, he's gone. Okay, let me try another one. I want to be married. Lord, please, Lord. Lord, please. See? Give me a prophecy, brother. I need a prophecy. You know, pray for me. Pray for me. See? And you, this is preoccupied. You are possessed. You're not whole. Unique means that you've discovered an originality in yourself that you know is irreplaceable. 
please buy this tape, man. It's good stuff. To be unique means you've discovered a uniqueness about you that is so original that you know there ain't no duplicate anywhere. All of a sudden, your value goes up in your own eyes. Ooh, oh, I am so important. Unique. Unique means I got something to offer that doesn't exist anywhere else in the world. And you will be a fool to ignore it. It's uniqueness. So uniqueness means I don't need your opinion or adulation or approval to feel worthy. Or oh, that sets marriage free. Because most people get married so they can feel valuable. That's why they get hurt so much when someone doesn't give them approval. It's tough. You know why I married my wife? Because she ignored me. It's the truth. When I was in high school, every girl was fooling with me. You know why? I was famous. Some of you all know my history. And they had to come water them on, talk to me and touch me. This woman didn't even look at me. I said, who is, how dare her not look at, what is wrong with this woman? Don't she know who I am? She ignored me all through high school. So I got mad and married her. <laughs> you keep throwing yourself on a man. That's why they keep running. Why? You are a parasite. A leech looking to place your sucker on somebody. Oh, glory, hallelujah. The beauty of being a single person is that you don't need anybody to be somebody. You are somebody all by yourself. Hallelujah. And when you bring that into a marriage, woo, that's beautiful stuff. Let me close with a an illustration. I want you to watch this illustration. This is my Miles Monroe famous illustration. Can you come here, please? You on TV, so smile now. You gotta smile. Hold them both just like that, okay? I want to show you all uh, the danger of getting married to an unsingle person. Oh, by the way, let me just clarify. Unmarried and single are different. This, this gets a little confusing. It, you can understand the difference. It's very important. See, most, most unmarried people think they are single. But if you look at the definition, even some married people are not single yet. That's why the marriage is so full of tension, stress. Because the wife or the husband is so lacking worth they almost sucker on the other person why are you leaving me you can't go away i don't, i need you it's, why you need me <laughs> i am no one without you I, 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 if you leave me i'll die see all those statements are proof that they are not single yet Next time you people who ain't married begin to feel like you want to get married, <laughs> and how that feeling come on you, remember, <laughs> don't confuse unmarried with single. What you want to do is to be single. Before you get married, and if you get married, still try to be single. Very important. Don't confuse the two. Let me explain why it's important to understand the two. Because, wait a minute. I gotta explain this. Because you see, if you believe that single and unmarried are the same, then you'll believe that the solution to your loneliness is marriage. But if you get married, 
because you are not single and you feel you need someone to complete you, then you are taking into the marriage an unsingle life. Which means you have created a formula for disaster already. It multiplies your loneliness. Nothing can magnify loneliness more than marriage. I speak as a counselor for 33 years. And the loneliest people I have ever met are not unmarried people. They are married people. You folks who are married, you don't know loneliness. You don't know loneliness. To live in a house, to sleep in separate rooms, you don't know that kind of loneliness. To live in the same bed and sleep back to back and don't talk, you don't know loneliness. To live in the same house but don't speak for months. Coming home at different times to avoid one another. Loneliness. You know what I'm talking about. I'm going to show you. Let me show you what they, what they said. Let me show you. Turn to Matthew 19. Let me show you the conclusion of this. How dangerous this is. This is very serious. Don't laugh at me. Father, forgive you. Verse 10. Out loud, please. Then the dis come on, Matthew 19, verse 10. Go. Then the disciples said to him, If this is the situation between a husband and a wife, it is better. I rest my case. Peter says, My goodness. If that's the qualification for marriage, it's better to stay by yourself. Singleness. All right. I got to show you all this. This is an interesting scenario here. Uh, I always try to show this because we get this idea about relationships. Okay. Now I'm going to show you. Yeah, that's good. Oh, I'll hold them now. Thank you. All right. This is a picture of what you've been taught in your culture. That's it right there. It's called 50-50 marriage. That's why you use the term, my better half. Please meet my better half. My better half? Oh yeah, she is my better half. And he is my better half. So you spend the rest of your life going around trying to find someone to complete you. The only problem is after you marry that person and you complete. We got a problem in the marriage here. So the person says, mm-mm, give me myself back. So they take themselves back, and now we got a marriage retention. You married me, take care of me. So why don't you fulfill me? Now she's lonely. Empty. And she said, mm-mm, baby, my mom didn't teach me that. <laughs> now you're getting uneven here, see that? He said, are you a woman? You crazy? Give me myself back. No, no, no. You think I'm crazy? You fulfill me, you know. Listen, you better give myself back here, yeah. i tell you what. Take yourself and go. <laughs> marriage. There's no such thing as a 50-50 marriage. 
stand here one more time. Let me show you what God intended. This is Adam. A little bit of ice inside too. Cool him off there, you know. And when he met Eve, that was Eve. That's a single person. Full, know who they are, know why they are, know what they are, know where they're going, know what they can do. And then they meet one another. So you meet somebody who knows who they are, why they are, where they're going, what they can do, and why they're here. Woo, what a combination to meet. Now when you meet that person, watch this. They decide. Everybody say decide. See, it's a decision because there's no, there's no lack. <laughs> there's no lack. So, any decision is a decision. We decide that we are going to enter a covenant together to combine these powerful assets to impact the world together as a partner with a partner. Now watch this. If you notice, if he gives her some of himself, it's what? Overflow. If she gives him some of her herself, it's overflow. In other words, the relationship being based on what I could get from you, what you could take from me and give me back with you. See, and this trading, you know, if you, I'll, you give me this, I'll give you that. It's pure agape. This person doesn't give because they need something. Very important. They give because they decide to give. This person doesn't give because they're trying to manipulate the other person to get something. They don't need anything. What a beautiful love. I'm going to miss next session. Because we're going to be talking about how to get yourself to that point where you become so secure that if anybody joins with you in life you are an asset right. not a deficit My Lord. thank you very much this is me thank you very much oh he tastes so good <laughs> well my time is gone I hope you learned something tonight. Give me a big hand.